Thank you for joining us today for Data Palooza 2022. We are very excited to bring to you a virtual research lightning talk on data and environmental resilience. Please hang tight as I um, am trying to track down one of my panelists. Uh, he, he may be having some issues logging in. Uh, we may need to shift things around and um, in the meantime, if Sally and Shang would be willing to perhaps kick us off so that we can get on time. Um, okay, it looks like Shang has agreed to start us off until uh, we can track down Professor Basner. So in the meantime, Shang Li will be presenting on trustworthy representation learning for fish identification. Shang is an assistant professor of data science here at UVA, and I'm going to give the floor to him. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Emma, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. All right, can you see my slides? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Xing Li, and uh, currently I'm an assistant professor of data science. And uh, I'd like to have this opportunity and uh, introduce our recent project on trustworthy representation learning for fish identification. So, as you can see, this project is relevant to the environmental resilience because of the study object. We want to understand the, the fish behavior, the fish population in river networks. So I will show you more details later. And meanwhile, feel free to let me know if you have any questions. So this is our project page on the USGS website, the United States Geological Survey. And uh, this is our team. Uh, Wei Li, Zhongliang, they are my PhD students in my lab. And uh, Ben and Tan, they are ecologists and uh, research fish biologists from USGS. We have been working on this project for over one year, and uh, we have published a paper recently. So our idea is to try AI technicals to revolutionize some ecolog ecology problems. In particular, we want to focus on understanding the behavior of fish and uh, try to help them design some tools which will make their job easier in terms of analyzing large-scale data and uh, getting insights from data. Then you may wonder why fish recognition matters. And uh, we know that in many different projects, we, we, we found that it's very interesting to see the behavior of fish, which will be an indicator of understanding the population change and also on large scale, how the environment change, how the climate changes. And uh, there are some other re relevant projects at USGS, which are closely relevant to the understanding of fish behaviors. So here I just showcase two examples of the projects. As you can see from the title, those things are relevant to monitoring the climate change or uh, understanding the climate understanding the climate variation across certain parts of US. So this is just a general sense of why fish recognition will be helpful because starting from the bottom, we will know what happens in the river networks. And uh, beyond that, they will have some other modelings to tell people, OK, what will be happening in the next few years. Then let's talk about the technical part. So when we look at this problem at the first place, we, our, our initial idea is, is, OK, we just search face recognition on Google Scholar and see what kind of solutions we have. right? Then if you do that, you will find out, OK, most of the existing papers on face recognition they mainly focus on recognizing the species of fishes, given those test images. So here I just list one popular benchmark dataset in this area. As you can see, the dataset has over 27,000 images. And uh, as you can see, they belong to 30, uh, 23 species. And the task is usually defined as recognizing what kind of fish is that, given a test image. This is not what we want because in our case, we will want to have a very accurate understanding about uh, one particular fish, fish species. And uh, that's why we consider our problem as <clears throat> a different one. We call it a fish re-identification. In other words, given two images, we want to determine if the two images are from the same individual fish or not. And uh, 
we have done comprehensive literature survey and found out that this problem has not been well studied in literature. And it's good news for researchers because we will need, we will have some new definitions of problems and then propose new solutions. So although this problem is new for the fish domain, it is not new in computer vision. As you can see in computer vision field, researchers have studied many different kinds of re-identification problems in different ways. The first example is person re-ID. In this case, you can imagine, okay, we have surveillance cameras in the airport, in the train station or other scenarios. And uh, the, when, when, when people go through the lobby, then they will have different views of the same, same person from different camera views, right? Then a very interesting and practical problem is how to, how to determine if the two images are from the same person or not, right? So this is a very practical issue. And the existing person reality model, they try to get uh, visual features from the input video frames and then try to do some matching to see if the query image can be matched to one of the images in the gallery set. That's the setting for that's the setting for those things. And uh, here we also have the second example of vehicle with ready. In this case, uh, you have images from different vehicles and they try to understand if they are from the same on same one or not, given different uh, images from different views. And uh, if you think about the fa face recognition, in particular, there are different tasks in face, face recognition. Uh, face identification means that we want, to we want to recognize the ID of the face, oh, sorry, ID of the face. And the face verification means that we want to check if the query image is from the same person or not. Just think about uh, when you use your, when you use a face to unlock your iPhone, right? It's basically a, it's, it's basically a verification task because your phone already stores your, 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 your face photos. And when you want to unlock your phone, it will take a new one and compare with the existing one. So this is actually a face verification task. Okay, basically we can see a lot of relevant uh, problems in the computer field. They are not about fish, but we can still borrow some ideas from them. And then more importantly, we found out that, okay, in those, all, all those cases, we have the visual inputs, either images or videos. And then we need to do matching. We need to compare the query image and the gallery image. The key part is always how to learn better features, how to learn better representations from the data. Then this problem can be well aligned with the main research topic in our lab. We focus on learning representations from data which means given the data as input, any kind of data, we want to learn features, and then those features could be used for decision making. There are many different ways to get features from data. If you think about some traditional ways, you can define some uh, handcraft features or some predefined functions to get features, high dimension vectors from input data, images or videos. You can also leverage some statistical modeling to get sparse representations from data, or you can use deep neural networks to get a, Different features from the input images as well. So many different ways to do that. And the key is always to get different features from data. And previously people mainly care about accuracy, but we argue that accuracy itself is not enough, especially for real world applications. That's why we focus on trustworthy representation learning, which means in addition to accuracy, we want to achieve trustworthiness. To understand trustworthiness, we have six different criteria in terms of the robustness, reliability, causality, fairness, interpretability, and transferability. And uh, we cannot imagine a single algorithm to capture all those properties at the same time. But for certain applications, we want to highlight several things. Now, let me uh, go over the fish, fish identification problem and see how we can leverage trustworthy representation learning to achieve that goal. So we have a data set, a very specific data set from the brook trout fish, and the images were captured in Maryland by our collaborators from US, USGS. We only have 559 images in the data set. It's not, a, it's not a large one. So our first challenge is limited data sets. If we don't have a large data set for model training, 
then in, it's very likely the model itself will not be robust. So this will be the robustness issue if we want to learn features from the data set. The second challenge is how to get discriminative features from the input images, because our goal is to do the fish identification. It's, it's desirable to have some features which can distinguish those fish, fish individuals so we can have a better accuracy. Then the third challenge is how to apply the models to other fish, fish species. Then the, 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 the question is like, okay, we design this tech technology and eventually we want to have a general solution which can help other fish species as well, or even other animals. So we want to make sure our solution could be transferable to other domains as well. So taking all those things into account, we design the first version of our solution. The first part is to perform model pre-training by using external fish images. We know that only using 500 fish images are certainly not enough to, to train a good model, especially a deep learning model. So we leverage the external data set from the Google Open Image data set. We find that there are at least 5,000 images about uh, fish and they provide labels in the bounding boxes of the fish image, of the fish regions. So we use those images to help us pre-train a fast RCN network, which is mainly used for object detection, and also used to fine-tune a ResNet-152 model to, to do the feature extraction. And the uh, results show that those things, those uh, practices have been very successful. And the second part is how to get discriminative features from the multiple views for fish, fish identification. When we talk about the face recognition or fingerprint recognition, we know that there are some certain unique attributes associated with each subject. When we look at the fish images about the blue trout, we found that there are some dot patterns or pigmentation patterns on the, on the skin, on the body. And the one assumption is that could this kind of pattern be, become the fingerprint of the fish? So we can identify each fish individual, even though they look quite similar in a general sense. So our, our idea is to apply some image processing and computation technical to extract those kind of pigmentation features. And moreover, we think overall, the visual features captured by the image, such as the general shape, the color, all those things could also be useful in terms of the recognition task. So we propose to fuse the two different types of features together and use them for the, for the final prediction. Combining the ideas together, this, uh, this, this is our fish identification framework. We have three stages. A, B, C, as you can see from the bottom. The, at stage A, we have images captured uh, from the lab. So we, we need to extract the ROI region, the region of interest, which only covers the fish body. So we use the pre-trained uh, REST net, uh, sorry, pre-trained fast RCN network to, to uh, detect the fish region and uh, extract the ROI from the raw image. And the second part is to apply some computer vision technicals to get the pigmentation features, as you can see from the grayscale image. And the third part is to do the fusion based on the ROI image and the pigmentation feature. So we use the ResNet-152 network to get latent features and then combine them together to do a matching. So this table shows that our method can achieve much better performance than the baselines. So here baselines, they are to conventional computer vision methods for, for image recognition. And we have much better performance than them in most cases. And moreover, we analyze the performance of ROI and uh, the pigmentation feature to, to see that those two kind of views could be complementary to each other and jointly they can lead to the best performance. Okay. And, uh, then I want to briefly mention the future work of our project. The first thing is to have advanced visual learning to improve the recognition performance of our model. As you can see, the current version, we use the ResNet-152, which is now new. The model was proposed in 2016. And next, we want to try some latest models such as vision transformers. We believe those kind of models can give us better features for recognition. And the second thing is to jointly model the fish population and the river systems. We have a recent work on physics-guided machine learning to understand the 
uh, lake and river systems. So based on those things, we want to jointly model the population of fish together with the dynamic patterns of river systems. And the third thing is to contribute the, to the community. We, we are talking to the other nonprofit organizations such as Wild Me to see if it's possible that we can contribute our AI solution as part of their toolbox. So our solution could be used by researchers and the practitioners uh, in other fields, other domains, as long as they want to apply computer vision and AI to analyze their uh, animal images. And finally, I want to thank my students. They work very hard on those projects and also thank my sponsors. You can see my email and my website on this page. Thank you for your attention. That's all. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sheng. Uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature in the webinar to pose questions for any of our panelists, and they will be able to answer them either um, verbally if there's time, or they can answer them also um, within the Q&A as well. So any questions for Sheng Li? Thank you, John. John said, great talk. Thank you. Any other feedback or questions? You could also feel free to reach out to Sheng directly afterwards. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. So we are gonna move on to Sally Pacetti, who will be um, speaking on observing air pollution inequality in cities from space. Sally is an assistant professor of environmental sciences at UVA, and I'm going to give the floor to her. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to talk about observing air pollution inequality at the neighborhood scale from space. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge the work of two really phenomenal students, Angelique Demetillo and Isabella Dressel, who've done the work that I'm going to share with you today. And this is funded by NASA and NSF, and I also represent the UVA Repair Lab, which is an interdisciplinary research lab at UVA focused on issues of environment, environmental and climate justice. All right, so let me get started here. Okay, so I'm going to focus my talk on one pollutant called NO2, or nitrogen dioxide. Dioxide. This is a, an, a harmful air pollutant that's emitted from fuel combustion and is visible from space. And what you can see here is a map of NO2 pollution. And really, we can point out almost every major city across the country. We can also point out large power plants. But what we don't see in this image, and I will discuss today, is how air pollution varies within these cities. So we know that air pollution is highly variable within cities. And one piece of evidence for that is that in US cities, uh, communities of color and low income communities uh, generally experience higher pollution burdens and also greater air pollution health impacts. So I'm gonna introduce two definitions for my talk. The first is environmental racism. And the definition of environmental racism comes from Dr. Robert Bullard who defined it as any policy, practice, or directive that differentially affects or disadvantages individuals, groups, or communities based on race or color, whether intended or unintended. The second definition comes from the US EPA, and that is of environmental injustice. And this is inequality or inequity with respect to the development, implementation, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws and policies. So these inequalities cause measurable differences in health and life expectancy, particularly for African-Americans. And despite improving air quality in cities across the United States, air pollution disparities have persisted. So the aspect of this that I'm gonna focus on is an analytical challenge. And that's that we've historically lacked measurements that resolve neighborhood scale spatiotemporal variability within and across cities. And so to give you a sense for the scale of the problem, for primary pollutants, meaning pollutants directly emitted into the atmosphere, we expect horizontal and vertical distance decay gradients in the order of hundreds of meters to one to two kilometers. And so if we thought about regulatory monitoring networks, we'll take Los Angeles, for example, this is arguably the best monitored city in the world for NO2 pollution. 
only three, three to five percent of residents of Los Angeles live within two kilometers of a monitor. So we have very large gaps in our observations. So a few years ago, we investigated the extent to which we can actually res resolve neighborhood le level variability in air pollution from space with recently launched and next generation satellites. And in this paper, we focused on Houston, Texas, and we utilized really high spatial resolution observations collected from onboard aircraft as a standard of comparison. And so NASA collects these observations, so not routinely, but frequently as a way to validate satellite observations. And it's effectively the satellite instrument put onto an airplane and flown closer to the surface of the earth, which improves its resolution. And as part of this work, we kind of developed a framework for analyzing these observations, and we identified that there's two qualities of a measurement that we must have in order to describe neighborhood le uh, level NO2 differences. The first is that we actually have to have the granularity, or the word I use here is resolution, to discern neighborhood scale differences. And the second is that the spatial patterns in the columns, keep in mind this is a satellite sitting out in space measuring all the pollution between it and the surface, have to match those patterns at the surface. And what we found is that with satellites, particularly a satellite called Tropomi, they do in fact do this. So we had these really detailed suite of observations in Houston, but we kind of want to, you know, we want to do more with these observations and, and study them in more places. And, and we're collecting these satellite observations daily, everywhere. And so for, really for me, these satellites have unrealized potential for community air monitoring. The measurements are spatially and temporally comprehensive. They're freely available and they come with no maintenance burdens to the users. And as part of this, they really are potentially democratizing. So I'm going to show you two analyses. One, we take this work that we did to understand these observations over Houston and we scale it up across the country. So we look at 52 cities. We population weight these satellite observations by race, ethnicity, and, um, and poverty status. And we compute inequalities as the difference between groups, for example, uh, African Americans and non-Hispanic whites, in each city across the country. Okay. And so what we still have to do is certainly we've shown that these observations work to discern neighborhood level differences in Houston, but there's still more to do to understand to the extent that they work in other places. This gives you a sense for the extent of inequalities across the country. So this is NO2 inequality with race, ethnicity, and income, a combined metric. And you can see that differences in population weighted uh, uh, NO2 pollution can be on, well, they're on average about 30%, but they can be as high as 40 or 50% in very polluted cities, particularly Los Angeles, Phoenix, New York City, Newark, and Chicago. So the first thing we do to evaluate these observations is we take, we, we look at how tropomi resolves inequalities as a function of segregation structure. So US cities are segregated. That's a requirement to have inequality, right? Um, but they're differently segregated. And they, there's a structure to that that varies along an axis of clustered or patchwork. So if segregation has a pattern uh, that's described as clustered, that means that neighborhoods with similar demographics are going to spatially aggregate. If we have segregation described as a patchwork uh, structure, then then even those neighborhoods are se segregated, they're going to be adjacent to neighborhoods that have different demographic composition. So the distance decay gradients of NO2 are going to happen on scales that are smaller than census tracts. So if we see relationships between inequality and segregation structure, that tells us there's something about the observation that isn't working. And it turns out that what we find is that tropomi can resolve these inequalities equally well when tracks uh, spatially aggregate or when they don't. So this is just another piece of evidence that's showing us that these tropomi observations are working. So one of the real benefits to using satellite observations is that they include temporal information that we can use to interpret the sources of air pollution. And so this is that same map I showed you in the beginning. You're looking at NO2 pollution across the country, but you're actually looking just on weekdays. And now let's take a look on weekends. And you can see that there's a dramatic difference in the amount of pollution across the country. In the United States, this difference in pollution is driven by differences in diesel truck traffic. So diesel trucks make up three to 5% of the total on-road vehicle fleet, but they can account for 40 to 50 to 60% of the pollution 
in cities. It turns out we don't see large day of week differences in other pollution sources. For example, we actually drive our gasoline powered cars about the same amount. So we can use this observational difference on weekdays and weekends as a constraint on the effect of diesel emissions on inequality. And so we have to combine that with knowledge of how the emissions change. And we can look here using an inventory that diesel truck emissions are 60% lower weekdays to weekends. So any observed change is gonna be in response to that experiment. So what you see here is inequality in all 52 cities across the country on weekdays, which is on the x-axis and weekends, which is on the y. And we can fit a line through that slope and we're gonna find the effect caused by diesel trucks. And so a 60% reduction in diesel NOx emissions causes a 40% reduction in NO2 disparities. And, and the sort of the direct mapping isn't happening because we do have differences in the pollutant lifetime weekend to weekday. But this was a, a recent rule put forth by the Biden administration says that by 2045, they're going to reduce emissions from diesel truck traffic by actually 60%. So here we've tested what the impacts of that are going to be on inequalities. So this has really pushed us, you know, sort of the valuable, the value in this information and time has really pushed us to sort of think like, well, maybe there's more that we can say. And so what we've done so far with Tropomi is we've looked at long time averages. And the reason for that is because the observations are pretty coarse, like at the nadir, so when the satellite looks directly down, it's three and a half by five and a half kilometers. That's a lot more coarse than that, you know, few hundred meter distance decay gradient that I mentioned before. So we average these through a process called oversampling, which allows us to get more spatial information because those pixels are not in the same place every day. But, you know, we said, well, maybe we don't get all of the information, but maybe there's a lot of interesting temporal information if we take the daily observations directly. So on the left, I'm showing you what we get with airborne remote sensing. We have a month of this data. It's 250 by 250 meters. So these data really do resolve those spatial gradients. And in the center, I'm showing you a, a single daily scene from space. So you can see the pixelation there, certainly. And on the right, I'm comparing it to this oversample tropomi, which is the heavily time average product. And so from what goes, from what I show you next, I'm actually going to evaluate the extent that that center image resolves neighborhood scale inequality. Okay, so we can compare this with the airborne observations. What I want to show you here on the right is that I have the slope and the, the correlation coefficient for a variety of inequality metrics. And what we find is that even though these observations have, very, have a much coarser spatial resolution, they're highly correlated and their slopes are pretty close to one. In fact, at worst, we're capturing at least 75% of, of absolute inequalities and 80% of relative differences. So even though there's some initial information lost when we go from the sort of very high resolution to the coarser observations, we're actually capturing a very large portion. So the next thing that we do in this evaluation is we think of two things. There's two other things that matter. One, how much of the image have we actually captured from space? This is what I call the UA coverage or the city coverage. So we find actually that this does cause a large bias in our inequality estimates. So we have to capture at least 30% of the city in our observations in order to get a reliable estimate on the, on the mean. Um, and we have to capture at least 60% of the city in order to get a reliable estimation on the daily estimates. And the daily estimates we, we do through uh, an analysis of the coefficient of variation. Um, and so this makes sense because as we sample less and less of the city, what happens is, is that the demographics that we do capture tend toward the majority. So we, we just sort of don't have, we just have a, a effectively a sampling bias. The second thing that we can do is actually take advantage of the fact that the pixel areas from measured from space are different. We can do this kind of natural experiment on the spatial resolution dependence of, of our observations. And so this is showing you all of the daily observations over a four year period and the mean pixel area over the city of New York. So there's a really wide range here, but keep in mind, we're trying to capture gradients that are on the order of less than a few hundred meters to one to two kilometers. So clearly these are much coarser. Um, it turns out though, I have the mean pixel area here on the left and then I have various uh, mean daily inequalities 
the daily coefficient of variation. And I'm looking at the difference in our inequality estimates as a function of pixel area. And you'll notice here that there's really no uh, resolution dependence until these pixels get very large. And so this is really this is this is really useful for us as we go forward and we use this tool uh, to inform decision making, because it suggests that these estimates really aren't that sensitive to resolution and this has kind of been something that this field has been preoccupied with to really capture really, really high spatial resolution. And what our work is showing you is that it's just really not necessary. But what can we do with this so one thing i'm just going to show you one example and I know that my time is up here. But what we can do is now we can take work that has focused on describing inequalities and we can actually situate that information into our broader understanding of variability in climate and air quality. And so a lot of uh, air pollution inequality work because it's been so focused on high spatial resolution maps has created a single map and the work then has been largely descriptive. But now we effectively have a time series and we can do that. I'm just going to give you one example to think about how inequalities might scale with climate change. Two things that we know are going to happen in New York City is that we're going to have more stagnant conditions, meaning slower surface winds, and we're going to have hotter conditions or higher temperatures. So on the right, you're looking at the relationship between NO2 inequalities and surface winds. And this makes sense, right? Because as the winds pick up, we're gonna have more distribution of pollution away from the sources. And we see that they're inversely correlated. But what we notice also is that we have very weak or insignificant relationships with surface temperatures. So as surface temperatures warm, what this means is we're gonna have more days with high burdens or more cumulative burdens. So in both cases here, we're gonna see that these inequalities without intervention are gonna be worsened with climate change. And with that, uh, I'm, I'm gonna stop and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. Again, feel free to use the Q&A feature to pose any questions for any of our presenters and they can respond. Uh, we have a few minutes before we need to move on to the third presenter. So if you've got anything for Sally or even for, for Shang Li, feel free to put it in the Q&A. No questions? Okay, well, again, you feel free to use the Q&A and um, we can go back and, um, and respond to them a little bit later. But for now, let's move on. So we did a little bit of shifting earlier and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that we do have William Basner with us and he's gonna be presenting on data science of hyperspectral imaging. And Professor Basner is a professor of data science here at UVA. Um, and so it's, we will go ahead and get started. Okay, can I start, oh, start my video? To, yep, feel free to share your screen. Okay. Ah, okay, terrific, thank you. Okay, so I'm Bill Basner, and I'm gonna talk about the data science of hyperspectral imaging. And when I talk about data science, <laughs> I'm going to talk kind of holistically, meaning we want to look at the data that we're working with in the application. We want to work with the algorithms and the software and put those all together to achieve a goal. But first, what I want to talk about is what is hyperspectral imaging. So a digital image like this one that we have here, this is a satellite image, um, is typically has a is comprised of pixels. And typically, each pixel has a certain amount of red and green and blue that were measured by the camera at that location. Um, but what a, when we have a hyperspectral image, apologize. So the red and green and blue are really just light that occur at different wavelengths. We have red and green and blue separate cones in our eyes that measure those three different wavelengths of, of light separately. And, and we perceive them as red and green and blue, but there's a lot of light, particularly in the infrared range that we don't see it can also be measured by a camera or often called a sensor um, because it's collecting scientific data as opposed to a camera. Um, and so what typically a hyperspectral image is, instead of having just three colors, we have 50 up to 400 bands 
or different wavelengths of light that we uh, we collect for each pixel, and then it allows us to do spectroscopy for each pixel. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. Um, so let's talk about light and reflection of light. So we're familiar with oranges and apples, and here's red grapes. And if we shine a light on each of these, they would each have a different amount of light that they would reflect back in each wavelength. So red light, each of these maybe reflects back 80%, but here, the amount of green is going to be different among the three of them. The things that we perceive as red don't reflect as much green, but orange is comprised of a lot of red and a little bit of green. And that difference when we plot the percent of light reflected back at each wavelength, that gives us a difference in these plots. Okay, so this is just three colors. Now, this is what happens when we have not just three, and they're not colors, they're now wavelengths of light. Um, and over here, we have our visible wavelengths. And what this plot is on the horizontal axis is wavelength. The vertical axis is the percent of light that gets reflected back. And so I have what are called spectra here, which is what we call a plot of the percent reflectance per wavelength for red nylon fabric, red cotton, and yellow nylon fabric. And this height here is the amount of blue that's reflected back. The amount of green that's reflected back is whatever the height is there. The amount of red that's reflected back is whatever the height is at that location. So we can see from these plots, the yellow nylon is reflecting a lot more blue and green than the red fabrics. And we see that in this, this area here. But if we look at, over to the right, we see that the nylon fabrics um, trace together with a lot of these little features, those little peaks in minima and maxima, they match each other for the nylons. And so what we have in the visible light, we tend to get color from pigments, which tends to, in the physics, tends to come from movement of, electronic, of electrons. And out here in the infrared regime, we tend to, when we take measurements, what we're seeing is actually the uh, different bonds that are present. And so all these little wiggles are present because those are nylon fabrics and the fat, ny different nylon fabrics of the different colors have the same chemical bonds. Um, and so here's a typical example of uh, lab spec. Spectroscopy. So if you have a material and you want to know what material it is, they'll often take it to a lab and they'll do spectroscopy, meaning they'll shine a light on it and reflect the, the whatever comes back. And so what I have here plotted in blue is uh, anthrax, plotted in green is flour, and plotted in red is powdered sugar. And so if I come across an envelope, this is actually a picture of the envelope that arrived, I think it was at U.S. Congress, and I think it had anthrax in it back at the anthrax scare time. But suppose I just have an unknown powder, and this is my unknown powder, and I take a collection of the spectra from that, so meaning I shine a light on it, and I measure the light percent of light that bounces off in different reflect, uh, wavelengths. What I can do is I can compare that to my known references. And so this is all of those spectra on the same plot. And so I see my, my unknown powder, this black plot, is matching very well with my red, which was powdered sugar. And if I got a mystery powder in an envelope and I got these spectra and for these materials, I would be sure enough um, that it's powdered sugar and not anthrax that, well, maybe I'd be willing to taste it. I'm not sure, you know, maybe the person who put it in the envelope was sick and something. So maybe I don't want to touch it, taste it, but I'd be sure that that's, an that that's uh, powdered sugar and not anthrax. Right? Another thing you'll notice here, the flour has a lot of similar shapes to the powdered sugar. And that's because flour and powdered sugar have um, similar chemical formulas. That's because what, those, what we're seeing with those shapes is the, uh, the light reflecting off the chemical bonds. Um, and when the wavelength of light resonates with the chemical bond, it, um, it gets absorbed and we get a dip. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do now is step out of my um, out of my slides and take a look at some software that we use to process hyperspectral imaging. And so this is software just for fun. I thought I would um, take software that's available. This is off my website and it's available on my GitHub. And I also put it in PyPy so people can download it with uh, PyPy and it's called HiSpec. So here in the command line, I'm actually going to install it just as a demonstration of 
when you're building uh, data science software, it's really nice to think holistically about the users, um, about making things available and open, open publishing. So um, this should be downloading the software and then installing it on my computer. Okay, um, and then if I want to run it, I can just go into Python and import high spec. And what that's going to do, it's going to give me a graphical user interface that I can use to interact with some hyperspectral imagery. So um, we're going to open up an image off the desktop. And so Here's the viewer. So here's our image. And this is likely a somewhat familiar place. This is the uh, this is Washington, DC. And so we said with each pixel comes um, hundreds of bands. So when we what we want really want to do is not just be able to look at this picture visually, but we want to do analysis on it. So if I click on the image, it's going to give me a plot. And that plot is going to be the plot of the spectra. And so you can see I clicked on grass. I'm going to click on some more different vegetation and different grasses. So those are grass pixels and you can see the consistency. We'll pick on some tree pixels, which you'll notice are similar in shape, but darker. And then here's some grass that we can pick on, um, that we can, we can click on and you'll see this brown grass. If you look in this region right here around the 750, there's a sharp jump, those brown grasses and we can edit the data so that we can make the brown, the two brown grasses um, bolder. Um, they don't jump up right around this point around 750. So that point around 750 is called the red edge. There's a lot of chlorophyll is, chlorophyll causes that jump up in vegetation. So here's the type of thing that we can do. So if you go take a tour of the, um, of the Washington Capitol, one of the things they'll tell you is that the dome of the Capitol, although it looks like, um, right here's a picture, there's the Capitol, here's a picture what the US Capitol looks like. The dome looks like it's made of stone, but it's actually in, uh, a metal dome and it's painted white to look like stone. So we can do chemical analysis right here on the dome of the US Capitol to determine is this, this rumor correct? So, um, so what we'll do is we'll go down to the Capitol and we're gonna click on the roof of the Capitol. And so this is what a spectra looks like on the roof of the Capitol, but we need some things to compare it to. So let's compare that and to get a sense of kind of how it varies a little bit. So now I have three spectra that are off the roof of the Capitol. And let me, uh, I should be able to change the colors on these so that they are blue, but it looks like my color picker might not be working. Okay, so those are three spectra that are off the roof of the Capitol. So let's compare that to stone. So this area around the front of the Capitol that I clicked on, that's a stone. And we know that stone, it's a marble off the front of the Capitol. We can walk up to it and verify that that's marble. And what I want to do is I want to look through the image and find out if there's something else that I can use as a reference um, that's a painted metal. And if I look over here, we see uh, these white tanks. Here, and these are actually white, like, um, tanks full of either water or liquid or something. And so if we click on those, now I have the purple. Now the question is, these original three pixels that I pulled off the capital, do they, are they a better match for the red, which is stone, or are they a better match for the purple? And one of the things that we can do is we can rescale all of these so that they match each other. And what we see is that the, there's a really good match between the three pixels that I pulled off the capital dome and the metal painted met the painted metal, and none of those match this red spectra, which is the actual stone. So we can confirm that that rumor is true. 
that the dome of the Capitol is not painted, um, is, is not stone, but it's actually a painted metal. Okay, so that's, um, that's fun. One of the nice things, and I'll just, um, take a look at a scatter plot of this data. So this is data, and I mentioned it's like 200 dimensions. And so we can look at the data in a scatter plot. And what we see are a lot of these different materials and each of these like arms that extend out in this scatter plot are different materials. Um, and you can see the clusters in the data. And so one of the goals in working with this kind of data is to do either classification, meaning identifying the clusters in the data, either from known materials um, or to do classification based on un unknown materials or to do a, like a target detection, like find everything in here that matches a polymer spectra. And so that's what we're really gonna talk about now is really doing detection. So I have something I've measured in a lab and I wanna find the pixels in my image that match that lab. So, one of the things that I've worked on for a long time um, is doing this in support of the Army. And here's a, a web link from a news article on the Army program that I supported. And so this Army program was looking for improvised explosive devices or you know, buried explosives um, that are you know, important to, to, to remove. And so the article mentions that they flew 72,500 missions and they wrote more than 18,000 intelligence products. So more than 18,000 times they found something and sent information out saying, hey, don't go here or somebody take, the, take care of this. So that corresponds to about 20 hours a day worth of flying every day for 10 years, or another way to think about this, that's 8 million images because we know about how quickly these sensors collect or 8 trillion pixels. So, to do the analysis on this data, we would have had, we've analyzed, done analysis on eight trillion pixels or four petabytes of data. Um, and that's other way to think about that. That's 2,500 images per day. But out of those 2,500 images, there's only five reports. So what the analysis comes to is you anal analyzing 2,500 images like the ones that we just looked for, looked at for Washington, DC. But how do we, how do we do it fast enough to be able to, do analysis on 2,500 of those and look for explosive devices. And um, when we are only gonna find five out of those 2,500 that, um, that have explosives. So, and now I'm gonna provide the kind of the solution for what enabled that. And the, uh, the enabling process was to not process everything manually the way I was showing, the goal was to process the data and then send out web links and HTML pages with the data as, after it's done. And so it, this is an example of the type of output that would be provided. Um, and here's a list on the left-hand side of the materials that were found. And this, I'm going to click on the LDPE. So LDPE is low-density polyethylene. Um, and you could see there's a lot of Bayesian model averaging and, and unmixing and um, linear regression things going on. But you can see over here that we found something where the red, which is our lab spectra, converged with the blue, which is what we found in the pixel. And so you could see the very specific wiggles and dips. In fact, this gold is from a high-density polyethylene. High-density polyethylene is what outdoor furniture and garbage cans are made of. Low-density polyethylene is a plastic like um, shrink wrap or what you would get at the store for a feud bag. So these low density and high density polyethylenes are very similar. The place you would distinguish is out here and we see our pixel, which is blue, is a much better map for the low density polyethylene. We can come over here and see this is where this was found. And we can open up the Google Earth link, which will show us in Google Earth this location. And when we see it, we find it's a place where they're storing hay bales and hay bales wrapped in, in a hay bale wrap. It's a plastic wrap that's a low density polyethylene. And I'm going to show one more example. Um, so this web interface that we're looking at is all um, data that's located somewhere far away. So this is Washington, DC. And so you can see we see a lot of the, 
these are polypropylene, which is the EDPM roof type. So you can identify roof types on, on houses. Um, but there's one kind of fun object at the bottom. It's an H, gets labeled HDPE. So it's a high density polyethylene. And we can look at the spectra and confirm it. But I kind of want to jump ahead and see here's the location. Oh, and this is 6% high density polyethylene. The, the pixels here are 94% other materials. And so we see it's to the left and up and north from this, this track. And these pixels are 20 meters by 20 meters. So this is from, this data is from a, a NASA aircraft. And what we're getting is the high density polyethylene off the plastic slides on this playground. And so just in conclusion, what we've seen here is the, the, um, the composition of putting together the right computational infrastructure, meaning we're gonna compute the data where it's at instead of trying to walk it over, which was kind of an older way to do it. And that allows us to automate the analysis of the, of the data and then just send back to the people web pages, which are similar to what um, we're looking at here. And they allow, uh, by putting the right algorithms on those, they allow a high accuracy identification of the specific materials based on their chemical bonds. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, in fact, all three were wonderful talks. Let's see, we have several questions that have come in for you, Bill, in okay. the Q&A. If you want to open that feature, you can read them. One from John, one from Jim. OK. Um, oh, this is, a, this is a great question from John. So I'll just read these. Um, Back. So, Professor Basner, can you comment on sources and cost of hyperspectral equipment? This is this is a, a terrific question. Something you can do as a hobbyist, or do you need expensive equipment? Any easily obtainable data sources? So, um, so uh, twenty years ago, when I started working in the field, the only hyperspectral sensors were built by the U.S. government, NASA, Jet Propulsion Lab, or uh, Department of Defense, and they cost ten million dollars and up to build. Um, um, and so they were super expensive. Now you can buy one for a hundred thousand dollars. Um, you can, but you can buy a, a sensor on a drone for a hundred thousand dollars. You can get them cheaper than that. Uh, it kind of depends when we looked at the wavelengths of the light. Um, it depends on which wavelengths that, um, that you need and how sophisticated of a sensor you want. Um, so. And then the question is, how about at a hobbyist level, or do you need expensive equipment? And um, the yeah, I don't, I don't know of any that would be in my hobby budget. Um, but a lot of small companies are are being able to use them. So one of the things that I'm really interested in is the kind of transformative methods of taking the things that we did for Department of Defense to find buried explosives and using them for commercial applications. Like uh, Ocean Spray now uses hyperspectral imagery. They put the sensor over the conveyor belt with the cranberries on it. And when they detect something that's not a cranberry, they have a robotic arm that'll pluck it off the conveyor belt. Um, so any easily obtainable data sources. So if you do a search, and there's some Google searching around that you can find some, some data sources, like some images that you can download. Oh, and the best way to get them, I mean, I'll just, I, I gotta give a, I gotta give a quick answer, but if you search online for NASA Avarice, you can download images, which is, this is where I got the image that I worked from, from NASA, the Avarice sensor, which is hyperspectral sensor, and you could look at maps and select the location you want, and download it over your house if they happen to have one over your house. The they download it. I'll just give you a warning. They download it in radiance, and the software that I showed has a way to convert it to reflectance um, data. So there's a little bit of like technical details to get it to the spot. But but yeah, so there's a lot of data here at Everest. Um, and is there a public library of hyperspectral signatures? Um, actually, what, one of the things we're doing right now at UVA, we have instrument and a grant in place that we're, that we're finalizing um, to both collect hyperspectral imagery and lots and lots of signatures of known materials and then put together put together a big public library. So there are a couple of libraries that you can find of this, the hyperspectral signatures, but they're, um, 
they're not big enough and they're not sufficient. Um, and then Jim had a great question. Why were there so many subjective definitions and assumptions at the beginning of the tasking statement? So was that, um, I'm guessing on this slide, um, one of the, now I, I, if, if I'm understanding this correctly, the, um, one of the things is hyperspectral images. The definition is that the uh, is a image is a hyperspectral image if it has enough bands to do spectroscopy, which can be anywhere from four, 50 to 400. So some people might call an, a band, an image with 40 wavelengths or bands in it a hyperspectral image. So there is a subjective definition of what hyperspectral means. And so there's no universal agreement on it. But it's a functional definition. Usually, it means you can do spectroscopy, which means you can distinguish between uh, different chemical materials. I don't know if that's what Jim's question was about. Um, and then, any quick thoughts on algorithm techniques to compare different spectra for different materials that prove effective? Okay, and yes. So, um, so in This software that I was working with, there's, you can make different classes of, uh, from, you can build what are called regions of interest. Now you can draw polygons over regions and then pull the specter for those different polygons and then download that as a, as a CSV file that you can open up in Python or there's built-in algorithms to do classification like a random forest, LDA. So I have my graduate student, Jade, Preston, who's doing work in adding more sort of classic, going through all the Python methods. Linear discriminant analysis is pretty good. You can usually get things a little better if you do linear discriminant analysis, put a slight modified version. Um, and the, uh, the best thing I can reference to point you to in the question of algorithms to distinguish them is my webpage, billbavener.com, which UVA does a really nice job with these. So thanks to everybody that's made these work. And then if you go to research, um, we can come down. There's a paper on using neural networks to separate classes. But this target identification, if you want to separate classes really well, this paper would give the best method I know to separate classes. And it, it separates the classes, but it also gives you probabilities of things assigning to different classes. Um, this paper below also uses something similar, and this is on um, NASA data on different crops. So if you're particularly interested in crops, that would be a nice one. So target identification for algorithms generally, and then there's a specific crops one there. Uh, I think that's everything. Okay, well, thank you again to all three of our panelists for a really interesting talk. And um, thanks to all of our attendees as well and for some really great questions. Uh, so this will conclude this session's uh, research lightning talk, but you can always um, log back in after the lunch hour at 1.45 uh, to stream, to live stream the future of academic data science session that will be held again starting at 145. All afternoon sessions, anything that takes place in the ballroom, uh, and you can go to the digital program online uh, to live stream the event. Uh, many thanks again, and I hope everyone has a great day.